Hello and welcome. While the COVID-19 pandemic is meant that now, more than ever, parents and caregivers across Australia understand the impact that missing school has on a child's life. And the reason for this is that everybody has lived it and experienced it both from an educational perspective and more importantly, a child's need to socialise and feel connected with their friends. But what about if your child was unable to attend school long term due to chronic illness or possibly due to a family member, parents or siblings being immunocompromised? Now, did you know that before COVID-19 that this situation affected more than 60,000 children in Australia? But thankfully, there's an outstanding organisation called Missing School that was founded to revolutionise this very situation with a view of keeping children connected and ending their missing school for good. So to help talk to us about this today, we welcome our special guest, Megan Gilmore, a social innovator who has worked on complex social and economic de development operations across 24 countries. Now, she is an expert in raising, fu raising funding for dynamic innovation projects and a leader in governance and systems research and advocacy for, uh, for students missing school because of serious illness. And she's also one of the co-founders of Missing School. Now, they are a charity dedicated to keeping seriously sick and injured children connected to their classrooms. Thank you for joining us today. How are you? Hi, Rachel. Thank you for having me. I'm so delighted to be here to uh, share with you what we're, what we're doing across Australia. Yes, and I'm very honoured to be able to help sort of get that message out to as many family um, and sort of households as, as possible. Now, to begin with, I'd love to understand how did Missing School come about and if you could tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, so Missing School came about um, from my own personal journey and that of two other mums uh, in Canberra when uh, our children experienced uh, life-threatening uh, complex illnesses. Uh, fortunately, our boys all survived those illnesses, but we realised at, at the time that they were, you know, going through these medical treatments and separated from their school <clears throat> for very long periods of time that, you know, while they were prepared to and had to, in fact, uh, deal with the medical situation and all the harsh treatments that they were experiencing, that they really longed for that connection back to school. They really miss their friends, their learning, the fun of being normal and belonging in their community. And so as mothers, uh, we came together to try and solve this problem of, um, you know, I guess forced absence from school because of an illness and what schools could actually do to help uh, solve that problem. Uh -huh. So Missing Schools is about keeping seriously sick children connected uh, to their regular schools and getting, I guess, their special learning and their social needs met through, I guess, everyday practices in their schools. Is, is that right? That's exactly right. And uh, you can imagine, as we discovered, that uh, while there's so much goodwill out there in schools, they actually find it incredibly hard to provide an education service to children who aren't in the classroom. Uh, which makes the COVID-19 situation extraordinary in the way that it has demonstrated the roles of schools mm -hmm. and how quickly they needed to, to be able to do that, i.e., you know, provide an education service to children who can't be in the, in the classroom because of the health crisis. Mm -hmm. just so happens to be a, a um, <laughs> community-wide global health crisis as opposed, I guess, to an individual health crisis. But... Everybody's Nonetheless. experiencing the same thing at the same time and they really can empathise yeah. with the situation yeah. now because, as I said in the, you know, in the introduction, everybody's experienced it, both from yeah. an education perspective and then how it really does affect children's uh, ability to, to, to not be social with their, um, with their you know, friends and everything else. Mm. Yeah, Incredible. and indeed um, for parents as well. So uh, parents needing to continue their work life for economic and financial reasons across this time or even across you know a family illness that illness of their child and then also trying to attend to their child's education which of course is about more than academics <clears throat> yes it's actually about it's developmental and when as we do we value education as an everyday part of life for our kids it's also showing them that they have a future that we believe in 
and that we're working to to assist them to achieve so So this is also a big message yeah yes that is so important to be able to show them that you that you believe in their future. That is really, really important. Very, very powerful. So yes, yeah. I hear that. And so I understand that Missing School aims to correct the balance using specialised technology. Can you t- tell us a little bit about this? Yes. Yeah, so when we started <clears throat> Missing School back in 2012, you know, the first thing that we, we realised is that we didn't really have <clears throat> any research on this issue. And um, we set about to get that. Uh, in other words, you know, before I come to the technology, it was really about, well, what do you do when children miss school? Um, how do you keep, how do you get them back to the classroom? So think about, you know, 2012 rather than 2020. Mm-hmm. And we've, that's, uh, re- that's the research where we found that there were more than 60,000 students missing school, often or for long periods because of a serious illness or injury. But actually that uh, we had to kind of, try to work that out through all different data sets because there's no there's no counting of these children through a data set in Australia and actually that holds true for many countries in the world the second thing is we couldn't find any evidence-based approaches across Australia that were being consistently used to uh, connect children to their school during that absence and the third thing we found is that of course it is the responsibility of our schools and our education systems so our idea at the time was, well, it must be technology because there's no proxy for presence. You're either there or you're not there. Um, sure, you can have a go between, you can write letters, but it's not the same as being present. So this concept of presence is what has driven our eventual uh, application, uh, you know, well, our way of dealing with this or showing how to deal with this which we did after governments came back to us and said, well, well, what's the solution? This was after we launched the 2015 report to a Prime Minister's statement of support and over 160 media articles. Um, the government just said, well, well what, what, what's the solution? Which we weren't expecting, to be honest. <laughs> we thought once we um, raised this issue up that everybody would sort of know what to do. But that gave us an amazing opportunity, which was... Uh, to put kids back into classroom through telepresence robots. And these robots stand in the classroom for these students when they can't be there. And so they can dial in from their hospital or home through their own device, um, be seen and heard in their classroom, see and hear their peers and their teachers and take their lessons in real time and engage in social activities like lunchtime or Um, assemblies or rites of passage Um, but importantly they can move around they control the robot and can move it in that classroom environment from their remote location so so this allows the child to see and hear the lessons but most importantly to interact with their teacher and their friends as well Um, so Mm. that both the teacher and their friends can see the child by the screen which is in the in in the classroom and can, I believe the child can navigate the robot through their computer or tablet um, if they're at home or in hospital and they can actually talk and interact with um, right. the teacher and their friends. Is that right? That's right, yeah. So the robot actually moves and I really want to point out this key difference because as we went into COVID-19, well, first let me say our schools already had the technologies for video conferencing. Zoom was already there. Skype was already there. Mm-hmm. There were laptops in schools. But schools still weren't using this technology for the purpose you and I are discussing. And and why is that? Well, probably because the schools um, didn't see this issue as their responsibility because it was complex, right? They weren't there. But uh, the great thing, the great difference between robot technology and, say, a Zoom call uh, is that you can see, the child can see a much broader uh, area of the room so they can see the whole kind of scope of the room, but they can also uh, do, as you pointed out, they can turn their robot, they can move their robot, they have control of, of that movement and that navigation, which really means they're taking up their space in the classroom as well. They have like a physical presence 
as well as a digital presence and they can move. Uh, they can turn themselves to look at things. They can look up and down, which is a key difference to other, well, to video conferencing, which isn't telepresence. Yeah. Yeah, so it definitely enables, um, the technology enables the children to, to feel connected, which is really important. And, you know, um, as you sort of were alluding earlier, you know, the absence of just normal interaction in, in, in classes and with friends can really slowly chip away, I guess, at even the most resilient child. Um, and you had I am um, an experience for that with, with your son. Um, I actually had a similar experience myself when I'm, I was in year nine at school when I, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So I was completely paralyzed and um, never really supposed to walk or do much with my life. But I really vividly recall having my MRI scan and laying there in the corridor um whilst you know i sort of had that 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 sort of drumming sound if anyone's had an mri um it's very sort of powerful sound that you hear behind you and as i was laying there think i was thinking all my friends were free at school having a great time and i was stuck inside this machine and it was just a horrible feeling um you know i think for any child to be missing their life their friends and just normality um as as they would sort of know it so i completely empathize with any child who's been in a, in a similar situation um i remember the school was lovely enough at the time to send some of my friends my closest friends in a taxi to come and surprise me at the royal children's hospital as they too were actually finding it very hard so it's not just the um the child itself of course that all of their friends i actually found out later that they were all in the library crying um when they heard and they heard what, what was wrong with me um, and about the situation which actually prompted the school to kindly send them to come and visit me so i think it's really important for us to just realize that this situation naturally affects the child that is sick but of course their social network also and everybody else that is missing them at school um, so i think it's equally as important for the other students in the classroom to be able to have the interaction with their friend who is equally going through you know the the um the experience and the sickness themselves as well so i just wanted to acknowledge that from a, a personal um experience as well so yeah thank you for sharing that story rachel it's the two things that stand out for me there is um you know first of all your courage for sharing <clears throat> your personal experience and i hear this so often i do a lot of presentations and <clears throat> i talk to a lot of people and you know what there's never a single room that i'm in where somebody can't share this from <clears throat> a personal perspective whether it was themselves or whether it was somebody <clears throat> their friend as you say or a sibling or you know a student that they taught so i i think the first thing is that this is so prevalent and we probably just don't know how prevalent it is and the second thing that you um shared which is not only your own personal experience of that and i'm sure mm. that's a whole other conversation right yeah. but the fact that you shared how your friends felt that's powerful because it's so true and we know this from our research um, that everyone in the class benefits when their friend comes back their peer comes back and uh, you're right it is absolutely um, uh, you know important to mention not only the peers <clears throat> but also the siblings and what they go through Yep. as well as of course the parents and the friends of parents so i think what this means for me is we've got to get this solved we we really need the first thing is for anybody who's listening to this and heard rachel's you know story there um this is absolutely able to be solved and what we're really talking about here is um deep deep social connection that we need and friendship you know we need the learning yes but to belong where you in your community is the most important thing as a human so i want to encourage everyone out there if you know anybody um just you know reach out to your network and let them know that about our initiative but also that we're doing a lot of work on policy change in this country and i truly believe that australia can be best in the world at this solution i believe it in my heart and i am committed to seeing it through until one day this kind of connection just happens as business as usual every every day everywhere across australia absolutely absolutely completely support that 
Now, um, we published your article and the title is COVID-19 Restrictions are Just a Glimpse um, of Everyday Reality for Sick Children and Their Families. Now, for someone who hasn't read the article yet, can you please tell us what it's about and what inspired you to write it? Yes, and thank you for this opportunity um, and for, you know, putting putting our article forward to your audience. So, uh, really what we wanted to say about the COVID-19 situation is that we what we saw across COVID-19 was that many of these children were more supported because now everyone was at home. So they had that inclusion. And what has happened is as classes have gone back, and I note that that's not true in Victoria, um, but as classes have gone back, once again, they're left out and you know, it's again, it just comes back to, you know, how, how schools operate. So the other thing that occurred that we wanted to really point out is that the COVID-19 situation meant that more children were now in this situation because of their complex medical conditions or because of their, um, their vulner medical vulnerability. Uh, children who would have been at school uh, usually, even with a chronic condition, we're now needing to stay home as well because they were at increased risk. Not only that, but their siblings, so that they, you know, that, that they weren't um, bringing the virus home, but also the children of parents who have a, a, a medical vulnerability. So the point here is that the number of students in this predicament has increased significantly yes and in general what have you found are some of the most common challenges that children with illnesses experience when missing school mm -hmm. okay um i'm happy to say that we've collected over 2,000 data points now across the three years and and by the way we're right at our three-year anniversary of implementing this um australian first and it was at the time a world first uh congratulations you know, national <laughs> thank you national telepresence robot pilot working across all illness groups across every state in Australia and across all school systems mm -hmm. and the three things that we we identified which uh, you know using using peer-reviewed research and literature on this issue as the top three issues these children face is um, as perceived by their parents is one uh, the disconnection with peers and mm -hmm. relationships disruptions to relationships and the difficulty it is to maintain those the second thing is academic underachievement and the third thing importantly and we hear this all the time is the anxiety created by um by i guess the illness but mainly missing school and then mm -hmm. and that that anxiety of returning to school and transitioning in and out of school always as um you know I'm here, but then not tomorrow I'm not. And, mm -hmm. you know, that disruption as well. Yeah. So, so there's definitely deep anxiety, loneliness and isolation, especially in the situation where there's been at least sort of 12 months of school absence, but it doesn't necessarily have to be 12 months. It can be any frame of time, Ooh. I think. Um, and yes. I mean, how can children's school absence affect them once they return back to school then? Yes. So this is a good question too. It's, one of those things that happens with going back to school is a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think one of the points about these, what we call the side effects of missing school is that many of them can be lifelong. And that's why we need to intervene now, mm -hmm. today. We can't wait till they're well. Many children who are unwell like to continue with their education and engage in their school and actually can which is something people aren't aware of and one of the things that you know you and i touched upon earlier in the conversation is is futures and what we know is that when there's a chronic illness present or you know a serious illness ongoing and there's school absence connected to that it actually affects school completion rates at lower school completion rates um, that in turn has implications for career attainment. And so what we're looking at is 
you know, social and emotional impacts and financial impacts going forward into the future. In other words, um, with our, the contribution that we're making, and it's absolutely essential to save lives, you know, but we also need to be able to make sure that we can create um, or create the environment for a life worth living as mm -hmm. well. And I often sum that up is, you know, it's about more than saving bodies. It's about saving hearts and minds at the same time so that these children can have a positive future and reach their potential now and into their future. Absolutely. So, and in, in, in general, um, I guess for the children that had returned back to school, um, I've read that through your research, you found that they found it very difficult to adjust and form friendships um, and their learning sort of suffered also, which is something that we need to take into serious consideration as well. Yes. Um, I'd like to know, do you believe that there's a, uh, a power imbalance between adults and children when it comes to this issue? And if so, I mean, how does this affect children's vulnerability and power then in this situation? Well, you just touched upon something there in your summation, and that is, you know, we need, when children are unwell, they get labelled with having a disease or uh, they get labelled as a patient. But really, their children and their identity as learners is, is a key factor in personal agency and um, education is a key factor in, in personal agency and being able to be more empowered. So I think that Look, definitely um, young children especially are not agreeing to their medical treatment. We're mm -hmm. making that decision for them and we should. And But this is where I come back to that fact and to speak to that power imbalance is if we are doing that on their behalf, we have a responsibility to make sure that we give them what they want and what they need not just what we see. And we see this coming out in our work too, where even when we do start to refocus, um, you know, schools and families on, on the child's education, everybody's worried about maths and English. But you know what? Maybe they just want to go to music class. Maybe they want to watch and participate in a conversation in art class. Maybe they just want to have lunch with their friends. And I think um, we really want to make sure that even in providing a robot, that the student's own voice is coming through in what they want that for. Because right now it might just be social connection, mm -hmm. you know, but what we also see, which excites me, is once you put them back in the school, we've seen parents report that it's given them resilience to face their illness and to get better. And it's given them hope and it's given them where they might have been disengaged with school um, it, it's given them a, a way to get back in. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all about the student's voice and what they need and understanding that. And we yes. adults need to listen. Yes. And within the current status quo, I mean, what is it that is currently hurting children and what other admissions or oversights are there that we haven't maybe sort of touched on that we should be aware of? Yes. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that well, one of the things about that drives all of this is that schools find it incredibly hard to, to provide an education service to children outside the classroom. And uh, why is that? Well, without getting too technical, I'll give you hopefully like a little short snapshot of what we've worked out in our theory of change. And that is, um, you know, we can't change the illness except with treatment. Um, and sometimes there aren't cures. And in that sense, when they can't attend school because of their illness, uh, we, you know, it's marked by the school as an explained absence, just like a common cold. So then what happens is the school in that way says, OK, it, they're allowed to be not here. They have a legitimate reason. And when children are unwell, schools stop support because they're not in the classroom and they're unwell. Mm -hmm. So you can see that when it's kind of looked at and coded in this way as if it's, um, it's an explained absence, it just ceases the, the support for the school. So what actually then happens is because they're invisible and they're at home, I mean, they're at home and they're invisible to the school, I should say, they're unseen and they're allowed not to be there. Over time, 
all of these policies, procedures, practices, funding, um, standards and guidelines that schools would use have not been developed, even though the law is there. At the top of the tree, the law is there to say they're covered by disability legislation and regulation and the disability standards for education. And, you know, they have a right to continue to access their classrooms and a right to participate on equal terms to their peers. Mm -hmm. So we've got the law. We now have a way to put them back in the classroom uh, with, say, telepresence robots, just like wheelchair or access ramps in the school. These robots allow them to be present. And what we're trying to work on now is all of those middle bits to fill in the policy, to fill in the processes and guidelines and procedures, the mm -hmm. teacher training and professional development, and all of those things that will make it an everyday reality. Mm -hmm. And on this, I mean, what are the ethics of child protection and how would applying them make a difference at all? Yeah, so we often talk about it as a child protection issue because, you know, it's harmful. Social isolation is harmful. Um, and while um, we could say, you know, there's no one to blame here in the sense that it's a kind of wicked problem and it's complex, what, what we do now is we have a solution and we need to implement it for, you know, we, we would say that school attendance is a protective factor in an otherwise setting of many risks for these children. So it's, it's absolutely a child protection issue in that sense. And people might find that uncomfortable to hear, but, you know, we, we do need to make sure that while they're getting their medical treatment, and hopefully, you know, they, they come through that, um, that they can have all of the things they need for their development and, and that are important to them. Um, and, yeah, so I think you're asking some really important questions that I don't often get asked, and I, I find that super cool oh, that we get cool. to talk about this. <laughs> well, I mean, otherwise, I mean, what are some of the, the common assumptions that are made about sick children that the people mm. generally... Yeah, just make an assumption about. And I love this question too. And I know this comes from your experience because people who've had an experience like this ask these kinds of questions. So one of the common assumptions is they're too sick. We need to wait until they're well. That's one very common assumption. And I touched on that before. This, the second common assumption is, oh, there's hospital school. Well, there is hospital school, but only in tertiary hospitals, not in every hospital. And hospital school services is super stretched. And we also know now that there are many, many, many children who are never in hospital, but are at home for long periods. And we know that even children who do have hospital treatment, hospital stays are shortening. And I think this is an important point to make here, is this is an emerging issue. The number of students are are growing because medical science is taking leaps and bounds. We have treatments and cures that we didn't have previously. And so many children are surviving serious illnesses, living longer with um, lifelong illnesses, and um, also getting better diagnoses as well. Meaning that there's a growing number of children that are having, you know, a serious illness that they live through and are missing school because of it and hospital stays are shortening as well because of better health care so they're spending a lot of time at home with little to no support in a lot of cases and, mm -hmm. and way too often you know that is the case so you know a, a stat that i'd like to put forward here now which is a bit confronting is that in developed countries like australia up to 30% of students will have a chronic illness, will be living with a chronic illness. That's so almost much. one in three students. Um, and I think even at school, these kids probably might not be seen. So here's the next assumption. If you're not at school because of a serious illness, then you're not kind of 
fit for education, like we better wait till you're well. And the other assumption is that when you're back at school, you're completely well. And that's not necessarily true either. And yep. students in school need extra support to get, um, you know, to be able to enjoy their education and their social connections to reach their potential. Yes. So um, I can translate that stat to you into Australian numbers of students. So 1.185 million students is a third of the student population, just that's to give a perspective. Incredible amount. Incredible yeah. amount. And, and, and with that, with the current climate, I mean, um, has COVID added pressures or impacted the missing school program? And I mean, if so, because I mean, I understand that due to the pandemic, um, the medical vulnerability of a sibling, a parent or a guardian actually means the number of children who are unable to attend school is much larger than before. Um, and as we said at the start of the chat, that there um, that pre-COVID that there were more than 60,000 children in Australia who didn't have the option of attending school due to their own serious long-term illness. So it's not only sick children who are affected in this situation, but um, with COVID, it's the, you know, the, the children of parents who are you know, compromised and therefore reluctant to send their children back to school as well. So I'd just love to know how COVID has really impacted current um, operations. Yes, for us, it's just mean, meant that there's, there's a greater um, call for our services and, you know, we've been trying to do that on the same amount of funding and, of course, charities have been impacted like businesses and the community generally in terms of funding. Um, and we, you know, we just need, basically we need more funds to be able to scale up our service and to make sure that it's available to as many students as possible. And that, so everything everything needs funds to drive it as well mm -hmm. and so that's one thing the other thing is we're really hoping and trying and testing at the moment that schools and education systems will fund um, these types of services and activities because it is actually a school responsibility and to date we've been doing it as a charitable initiative um, as we reach out to ask for contributions from schools Unfortunately, in many cases, um, schools are saying they, once they find out that, that, you know, we're asking for a contribution, which is volunteer, voluntary, by the way, um, that, that uh, the placement doesn't go ahead. And um, that just tells me that schools are probably still not seeing that this is actually something that they should be doing. Mm -hmm. And... I wanted to sort of just um, speak about the wider family unit also. I mean, does this situation affect siblings of children who have chronic, chronic illness, sorry, and if so, because, I mean, my understanding is the siblings of children who have chronic illness um, are restricted uh, for fear of passing on, um, you know, I guess any illness to their unwell brother or sister, and they too can be discouraged from attending school due to the risk of bringing, you know, infections back home and that sort of stuff also. So I'd love just to know. Yes. Yes. So that's happening. And we just honestly have no idea about that number in the COVID context. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but in the general context, in this general context, siblings are absolutely um, affected and are often the most unseen of all. And that, you know that has an emotional impact on them they're often um they're often having to you know like the whole family adapt to this situation all of the time in a medical context they too miss school off and off for long periods especially if the the child with a serious illness needs to be have treatment in a place other than their home which happens often if you're in a rural or community you know remote community community area or indeed uh, where children travel into state for their treatment which is also a common thing as well you'll see that the siblings are either going with one parent in that context or and 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 they're missing school or having to maybe do some hospital school if the hospital school will allow it or, or and in many cases it, it can't accommodate so they're going to another community school so a big shout out there to four siblings and i really wish we had more data on on it for the covid context but mm. we do know from our own data sets that parents, at least 20% of parents report that the sibling misses school off an awful long period because of their brother or sister being unwell. Yes. So that's one in five. 
That's a lot. Yeah. And Amy, from your view, what does it take to make behavioural change in adults and that being education um, and health practi practitioners and parents as well? Yes. So the first thing that I would love everybody to take away from this is we should never assume to wait till they're well. We should always be asking them what they need now and accommodating that because after all, they're putting in a big job, aren't they, to, to, to try and get you know, get back to school themselves, whether it's a lifelong illness or, a, a, you know, chronic uh, or indeed a, an acute illness. And they're going through all of that. So I feel like that's a really important point. Um, the second one is uh, to, um, you know, to make sure that we we are providing them with, with what they need to get back to school. And I talked about telepresence robots as like wheelchair ramps in school and to understand that they have not only a right to be educated um, even based on their difference but also that the disability standards for education which sits under the disability discrimination act a national act that applies to every education provider across the country no matter where that is or what type of school system it is um, provides for children with illness uh, to be able to maintain their education, access their school, uh, receive their curriculum and participate and get support with assistive devices on equal terms to their peers so that they can be present in their schools. And, you know, Rachel, maybe five years ago, that was harder because we didn't have the technology to get them there. But yes. it's absolutely it's absolutely available. It's it's cost effective. It just makes sense. So I would love parents, educators and the wider community to know that, uh, as I said earlier, it's not only a right, but it's also the law. And we already know we've proven it's able to be done and many many great schools are out there doing it already we just need to make sure that everybody knows about this and understands the legality of it and and embraces the solutions uh, mm -hmm. and i think that as i said earlier i think australia can really because we have those laws um we can be best in the world at this mm -hmm. we can do this and, and, and in what ways can people help the Missing School Charity then? Where, where can they find you guys? Um, www.missingschool.org.au. Uh, donations are always welcome. Um, we have done this on the, the smallest, most minute budget. And uh, we're also looking for community members to to share what we're doing, to share with their friends and families about the essential nature of this for children and who are in this predicament. And as you said, their peers as well. You know, we've, when we talk about how many students we've supported, we also count in that the number of, of peers on estimate as well, because that's the connection, right? It's, it's that joining together again and being back in that community. So my, my great wish leaving this conversation is that more people know about this, more people talk about it, and more people expect this to happen um, in their schools, in their school communities every day. Um, and that, you know, that the funds get opened up, however that happens, for it to happen across Australia. And we make it business as usual, we all join together um, and everybody can can do at least one thing, which is, you know, believe in the future and the present of children who are unwell yes. to share that message. Look, Megan, this has been wonderful chatting with you. We'll have all the links um, in the show notes so pe people can find you and make a donation. Um, and just wanted to thank you once again for your time. But take care and uh, stay in touch. We're really, well, I personally will be watching this um, sort of, you know, throughout the, the next six to 12 months and beyond as well. I can't wait to see where it's going to go. Well, thank, thank you so you, much. Rachel. You take care. Thank you. Okay, bye.